lights on here so you can hear me. Uh, welcome to Holy Trinity in Thorn Hill. And for all those here and for those who are uh, watching from remote areas, I understand people in their cottages watch us. And, uh, and so it's nice to know that we have a very uh, broadly spaced uh, group. Um, and this morning, we, um, I feel very privileged to be here, and I know that you have been praying for me, and I appreciate that. And uh, this week, I got um, a very good pathology report. Um, so, in fact, I've, I've come out of this very well. It isn't over quite yet, but nevertheless, um, it's better than might have been expected. So thank you for those prayers. <laughs> yes. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and sent into our hearts the spirit of your Son. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that all people may know the glorious liberty of the children of God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. Hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. 
What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Congregation, please, Psalm 80, 1 to 2, 8 to 18. Congregation, please say the refrain. Behold, attend Remember this one. Preserve, Preserve what your right hand has planted. Hear, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. Shine forth, you that are enthroned upon the cherubim. In the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come to help us. Preserve what your right hand has planted. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared the ground. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. Behold and tend this vine. Preserve what your right hand has planted. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall so that all who pass by, who pass by pluck off its grape? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Behold and tend this vine. Preserve what your right hand has planted. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven. Behold and tend this vine. Preserve what your right hand has planted. They burn it with fire like rubbish. At the rebuke of your countenance, let them perish. Behold and tend this vine. Preserve what your right hand has planted. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, the son of man you have made so strong for yourself. And so we will never turn away from you. Give us life that we may call upon your name. Restore us, O, o Lord God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. Behold, preserve what your right hand has planted. Let us pray. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ, our good shepherd. You have led us to the kingdom of your Father's love. Forgive our careless indifference to your loving care for all of your creatures. And will make us in the likeness of your new and risen life. We access in your name. Amen. Amen. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. 
Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wished it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it's going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be a scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know not how to interpret the appearances of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I speak to you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most people don't want to think too deeply in the summer. That's why they give kids the summer off school. They wouldn't concentrate anyway. Ask any kid who's gone to summer school. 
Our lessons in the summer do not reflect this reality. I have always found them quite difficult and serious when I want to be frivolous. The world, however, does not stop being serious. People still die in hospitals and on our streets, in Ukraine, in floods and forest fires. This hot summer seems to be boiling with angry people, prepared to disrupt our lives with what seems to us as senseless killing. The reemergence of a more normal way of living together after the pandemic is still filled with problems. Labor shortages, inflation, fear of another outbreak, of an uncontrollable viral disease. So because of all this seriousness, I'm going to sprinkle my sermon about the meaning of faith with a little resource I came across when I was looking for another book in my library. Pet's Letters to God, translated by Mark Ricklin. Here's an example. Dear God, do you have any pets? Or are we all your pets? Love, Esther, the Persian. I read a book one summer a few years ago. I should say I reread a book. It was one of my textbooks during my studies at Trinity College in preparation for ordination. Well, that isn't entirely true. I began studying at Trinity because I wanted to know more about the church and what we say we believe and why we do that. It resulted in my ordination to the priesthood, but that was not necessarily my intention when I began my studies. Studying for a degree in theology was more about my faith journey and my need to seek a deeper understanding of God and how we express our understanding of God in today's world and why. I was looking for meaning of faith. Occasionally, I go back to my library and pick out one of the books I chose to keep from my college days and reread it. This time it was a book, The Dynamics of Faith by F Paul Tillich, published in 1957. He was a religious philosopher still deemed important in 1990 when I was assigned the book to read. I had tons of reading to do in my course load and I honestly thought I had not read the entire book. But I had, because the book was full of underlining and little notes in margins in my handwriting. I was more impressed by the book than I expected to be. When I read The Apostle for last week and this week, I began to ponder the issue of the meaning of faith more and more. When I went back to my library to refer to Tillich's book, and I found it, it was a smaller book than I remembered. I also found the book of prayers that I hope will keep us focused on God's love and grace. What you're going to get this morning is what I still remember from Tillich's book because I found it helpful and probably quite formative in my understanding about what faith means to me. I think it can help all of us as we move from a simple faith learned in Sunday school to a faith that can carry us through an adult life full of contradictions, doubts, disappointments, cancer disease, and even the violence experienced by religious people.
and even from religious people. In my view, religion, our way of expressing faith, is not protection from the reality of life in a world we do not control and do not always understand, but rather religion is a way to survive with hope, love, and joy. In spite of all the predictions that it will, the reason religion and faith have not disappeared is because true faith is based on an ultimate concern that transcends this life and our understanding of it. As Christians, we say that our ultimate concern is God and that Jesus has shown us the way to come closer to our destiny with God. The opposite of true faith is idolatry, the worship of idols, false gods, false ultimate concerns. Tillich uh, talks about how easy it is for a religion that begins as a true faith to become idolatry. Hymns and buildings, icons and rituals can become the focus of worship instead of a means to experience and follow the way of Christ to the presence of God. Concentrating on sins, our own and those of others, can keep us from finding God's mercy and love. Dear God, if a dog barks his head off in the forest and no human hears him, is he still a bad dog? Which the boxer, in the eight o'clock service, people chuckled. If you want to chuckle, you can chuckle. Our lessons this morning seem to focus on the sinful behavior of God's people, the ones who let God's vineyard become wild grapes, no good for wine, instead of carefully tended grapes that would be useful. Or the bickering blind hypocrites that Jesus claims cannot understand the future he is prepared to die for. Paul tries to tell the Hebrews that they should not worry so much about the consequences of being a bad dog and get on with the race that is set before us. The race, the faith that will take us to the throne of God. Tillich says that all true faith includes an element of doubt because if it is about an ultimate concern that is about our full experience and understanding, then doubt will be a part of our journey to find a deeper understanding and experience. This may be kind of shocking. Many of us were taught to never question our faith as if one little doubt would destroy everything and we would lose the comfort and grace that we know we need. I was talking to an old woman in the hospital, a good Baptist, and they often want to talk about their faith. She began by talking about doubt, her doubts, and how her faith had still remained strong in spite of them, or maybe because of them. I'm quite sure she never read Paul Tillich. However, she reached the same conclusion as Tillich, not through philosophically analyzing scripture, but through the wisdom of real life 
experience. The comfort of knowing that God was with her had sustained her through the tough problems of life. And she was convinced would be with her when she left this life behind. Dear God, are there dogs on other planets? Or are we quite alone? I have been howling at the moon and stars for a long time. And all I ever hear back is the beagle across the street. Max. Tillich talks about how faith needs courage to overcome doubts and stay focused on seeking the ultimate concern. How easy it would be to go along with what our neighbors say, what motivational speakers say about what we should be seeking in life. How much more difficult and courageous to persevere in seeking a greater clarity and wisdom. We could stop howling at the moon and stars, but would still not know whether or not we are alone. It takes courage to say, I believe that God is with me, and I am beloved and worthy of that love, even if there is no definitive proof only the reassurance of my feelings. The rewards are not necessarily immediate in physical terms, but they give us hope and strength to carry on. Tillich says that true faith changes the way we view the world, the way we live in it. If it does not free us to dedicate ourselves to service to God, then it is not true faith. Service to God is service to all God's children, to all of God's creation. That is what we have been created for. It is our missional ministry. True faith is not about what words we use to describe what we believe about God or what rituals we use to affirm our relationship to the Almighty. What we need to find is rituals and patterns of worship that will help us to stay focused on what is our ultimate concern, our true faith. The true faith is seeking God and putting our whole life into that race, that purpose that gives meaning and hope and joy. True faith is trusting that God has prepared us for the race that is set before us. And so by running it, we shall find the peace that passes understanding even in the midst of many challenges. True faith inspires us to give thanks for all we have been given and bring blessings to the world. So finally, dear God, when my family sits down to their dinner, they always bless their food. But they never bless my food for some reason. I have the feeling that I'm missing something here. So I've been wagging my tail extra hard when they pour out my food as my own blessing. Have you noticed, Royce? Amen.
Please stand. Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We begin our prayers this morning by offering uh, a prayer of thanksgiving because for the Anglican Church in Japan, they have just elected and consecrated their first female bishop. So we give thanks for that. We also pray for the United Kingdom and they're still enduring excessive heat. We also pray for people in East and Southern Africa who are experiencing not only extensive heat, but flooding and famine. We also pray at the conclusion of our Lambeth Conference, which I've said before is a gathering of all the Anglican bishops throughout the world to look at the church and to talk and converse and determine uh, not directions legislatively, but to begin to share and to be open to one another. But at the conclusion of this Lambeth Conference, one of the things that have emerged for our communion and our theologians and our bishops and our dioceses all over the world is for us to begin to learn what it means to be in communion when we are not in agreement. And that's the struggle that we have as a church, uh, to remain true to our Anglican flexibilities, but also to do that as a communion and fellowship of churches. And this is probably the first time in our history where we are having a challenge of, of this nature, of this magnitude. So we pray for us as we continue as a body and as a fellowship to discern and stay in conversation with one another. Let us pray with confidence to the Lord by saying, Lord, have mercy. For peace from on high and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, especially for Ukraine and for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, in our Anglican cycle of prayer, for the extra-provincial churches, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For our bishops, and for all the clergy in our parish, the Reverend Canon Barbara Hammond, Brother Reginald Crenshaw, the Reverend Canon Stephen Crowther, and our staff, Rachel, Jesse, and Jesus, for our wardens and for and the many volunteers who contribute so much in so many ways, and for our virtual chapel coordinators. In our diocese, Parkdale, Toronto West Deanery, in our deanery, Christchurch Stouffville, 
the Reverend Lisa Newland, incumbent. Let us pray to the Lord. For Elizabeth, our queen, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, for Mary, the governor general, Justin, the prime minister, Doug, the premier, Maurizio, Frank, David, John, the mayors of our cities. Let us pray to the Lord. For Thornhill, Toronto, Vaughan, and all of York region, and for every city and community, and for those who live in them in faith, in our parish family, Nida Dallaire and Esan, and Parmi Esmaili, Gladys Smith, Eve Spafford, Ruth Staples, Brian Stapley. Let us pray to the Lord. For good weather and for abundant harvest for all to share, especially for Afghanistan and for the disenfranchised and marginalized in our communities. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who travel by land, water, or air, for the sick and the suffering, especially Anne, Suzanne, Fred, Ian, Jean, Jean, Cleo, Keith, Florence, <coughs> Joyce. For prisoners and captives, and for their safety, health, and salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, strife, and need. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who have died, especially those known to us, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Remembering all the saints, we commit ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our God. To you, you, Lord. Lord. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved son that when two or three are gathered together, you will hear their requests. Fulfill now our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, eternal life. For you, Father, are good and loving, and we glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The Parish Selection Committee Prayer. Almighty God, Look graciously on us, the members of Holy Trinity Church Thornhill, during this time of transition. Be with us and lead us as we seek the next priest and pastor for our community. We ask your direction and guidance for those who have been appointed to identify a new incumbent, that we may choose a competent and faithful leader who will care for your people and equip us for ministry. Grant them ears to hear the voices of those whom they will interview. Ears to hear each other as they deliberate. And ears that are attentive to your voice as they discern the best choice for us at this time. Continue to lead us with your Holy Spirit as we patiently wait upon you and on the outcome of this process. We ask through 
Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites them to this table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. We confess the most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you are able. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another.
Let us pray. Loving God and Father, you have adopted us to be your heirs. Accept all we offer you this day and give us grace to live as faithful children. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God, for you created all things. You formed us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. When we turned away from you in sin, you did not cease to care for us, but opened a path of salvation for all people. You made a covenant with Israel, and through your servants, Abraham and Sarah, gave the promise of a blessing to all nations. Through Moses, you led your people from bondage into freedom. Through the prophets, you renewed your promise of salvation. Therefore, with them and with all your saints who have served you in every age, we give thanks and raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. God, source of light and goodness. All creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He healed the sick and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things, he fulfilled your gracious will. On the night, he freely gave himself to death. Our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. 
And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Gracious God, his perfect sacrifice destroys the power of sin and death. By raising him to life, you give us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you, Father, this bread and this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I am the bread which has come down from heaven, says the Lord. I am the vine, you are the branches. The gifts of God for you, the people of God. We worship and adore you, Lord Jesus Christ, present in the Holy Sacrament and in your people who are gathered in spirit. In this moment, I join with them to receive you in my heart and in our community. May you, enthroned on the altar, be now enthroned in my heart. May you, present in bread and wine, feed and renew my soul. May you give yourself to us again, fill us with grace and heavenly blessing. Even as I am fed, may my hunger for you and for your reign of justice and peace increase, that I may, empowered by your spirit, work for that day when your reign shall come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. blood of Christ shed for you.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we have received a token of your promise. May we who have been nourished by holy things live as faithful heirs of your promised kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you forever. Amen. Please be seated for some announcements. Good morning. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, first of all, um, as we said last week, Peter will be for Wednesdays in August, will be in the parking lot between 9 and 10.30, the south parking lot, to accept uh, contributions to the, to the food bank. Um, I resumed some of my duties at the food bank uh, last Tuesday, and uh, the, the numbers that are continuing to come on a daily basis um, are almost routinely now at over 40 a day. That's one person for each family. So that you multiply that by the size of the families. And remember, they can only come to the food bank once a month. So uh, there are many people in our catchment area um, that are in pain. So. Peter, bless you for what you do, and all of you for what you contribute. Um, it has been a relatively quiet summer uh, since the day camps in early July, as I say, in the country beyond the door. Um, but it's starting to stir because life begins again at Holy Trinity in September, uh, always with the preference, the good Lord willing. Um, and so we are looking at um, uh, relatively early in September. The date will be confirmed this week, so we will be getting all that information out to you. Um, but we are looking to have uh, Welcome Back Sunday, uh, uh, which is also the Sunday that we will celebrate the ministry of, of our Sunday school leader, now retired, Judith. Um, <coughs> We will be starting Sunday school probably on the 11th um, the, uh, on that Sunday as well. At le we will at least be selling raffle tickets for the ACW for their event later in the fall. And uh, I'm not quite sure where the footlights will be, but if they have tickets, we will be selling those. We will have information on the uh, seniors luncheon plan for later in the fall. And uh, we will be starting coffee. <laughs> um, and in light of that, we have to, uh, we have to get ready. So um, I have been in conversation with a few people and Linda Gould will be um, leading uh, teams to, for instance, clean up the kitchen. And I thought I'd, I'd uh, read the, the list to you of just what it will take to get just one room in this building ready for life again. Uh, we will, all the dishes will be washed, cutlery, pots, pans, trays, we'll, they will wash out the cupboards, they will bleach the mugs, they will wash the white plastic tablecloths. Um, we had, had, had a dream of having 
all of this kind of work done on one day and just have a, a joyful celebration of work with everybody. But the world isn't quite there yet. So we are, um, Linda and Ruth Staples have suggested that at least for the kitchen, they do it in uh, teams, two teams of six to eight people. One uh, will work at some day to be determined on the week of the 22nd and another of the 29th. Um, letters will be going out to the various ACW groups, but if anybody uh, would like to join them, please contact Linda and we'll provide you with uh, her phone or, or email address if you don't have it. Um, we will also be, as I said, uh, creating a committee to help do coffee for that day and we'll be looking to see in this post-COVID world how we organize and arrange uh, ongoing coffee after that so that work is uh, still to come. Um, there was something else that I was trying to think of, but I can't think of what it is. I see Rebecca here. But that at least gives you a sense of, uh, of what's happening. Uh, we will also be trying to do um, a little advertising outside our own ranks for life beginning at Holy Trinity in the fall. So if anybody has any ideas on, on communication uh, vehicles we can use, please let us know. Rebecca. Just very quickly, we, we don't have a lot of people this morning, but you're here, and we are so blessed that uh, Neda uh, Delaire has uh, joined our parish and is a photographer. And we'd really like some joyous faces on our new website. It's a little dour. It's a little too much building. So if you'd be willing to just, um, after you do your final prayers and uh, the postlude, if you just gather up here and sort of, you know, we'll have a group shot um, or a couple of group shots of, of smiles. I can see the kids right now going, oh no. But anyway, that would be terrific. Thank you so much for considering. It, it occurred to me uh, this Sunday, um, as I kind of was reflecting on where I've been and thinking about my life so far, I had another life before I became a priest. I worked in uh, hospital laboratories, particularly in the blood bank. And right now there is a serious shortage of blood. Um, and I can't be a donor because I'm too old and my hemoglobin's never high enough. But if you can, um, it would be a wonderful thing to do because, um, you know, people still get in car accidents. Uh, a lot of cancer victims uh, need uh, blood. And th the blood is used in some very creative ways. So if you are able to make a donation uh, please uh, make that appointment in the next week or two. Thank you. Yeah. Pardon? Oh, well, I sort of did at the beginning. I, um, I heard from the, um, uh, my surgeon about the pathology report from my surgery. And um, my lymph nodes were clear and clean and they got, they believe, all of the cancer. So I'm theoretically well, but that's a theory because I still have some, you know, little pains and here and there. But I am feeling, let me tell you, compared to four weeks ago, I feel completely well. <laughs> so. And, and I know it's your prayers that, that have been with me. So um, please, you know, uh, remember when you're walking through that desert that God is there with you. And that's certainly something that became very clear to me in the last four weeks. So um, we'll be heading off. We're singing a hymn, I believe. 